going to invite you to open up your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 15. We're back in the Gospel after our Resurrection Sunday, even though we did spend some time in the Gospel of John during Resurrection Sunday in chapter 19 and 20. We're going back to where we uh, originally left off. Chapter 15, verses 18 through 25, that will be our text this morning. And let's read it together. The Word of God says in verse 18 and on, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my Father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without cause. That is the word of God. This morning, the theme of this verse is fairly evident. I think you've heard and seen enough the word hatred, 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 hatred. It's fairly evident, it's fairly emphatic, and it's placed emphatically even in the Greek text. It's placed almost at the very beginning of every phrase. Hate, hate, hate. And this is interesting because it's in direct contrast to some of the six, seven last verses in chapter 15 that we studied before getting to this point which is love, love, love. We have here a world defined by hatred. The world hates. Disciples love. And so before we move forward on this, we have to understand that John sets this up as he does so from the very beginning of his gospel, this contrast between a world and a disciple. A, the world and its followers and Christians and Jesus and his followers. So the disciples here will stand really in our place in the 21st century as a model of discipleship yet again. I think you've been getting the, the, the point as we've been going through these chapters together that Christ is leaving in the physical sense, his disciples behind and modeling them for them what it means to be a true follower of Christ. And so from their model and from their example, we can follow along and know what it means to follow Christ. Before getting into the text, there's a familiar story, or maybe not familiar, but a Story, nonetheless, in the, in the church history world, in the early 4th century, there was a young man who was so devout to God that even as a child, he would practice or play in the playground, per se, in the playground of Egypt's coasts. He would play with his friends, baptism. Let's play how to baptize one another. He was so devout to the things of God that early on in his age, even at his early 20s, he was found at a council called Nicaea, where he was defending the orthodoxy of Trinitarian doctrine, of Christology. And this young man in his early 20s found himself not in the universities, not in seeking a career path, but rather worried about people getting, or the church getting, the doctrine of the Trinity incorrect. This young man was known as Athanasius, and Athanasius, after Nicaea, after 
promoting the correct form of Trinitarian doctrine where the Arian movement was saying that Jesus was made at some point or the way Arius would say it, there was a time in history where Jesus was not in existence, claiming that Jesus was a created being and therefore not the Son of God as he claimed He was not deity, rather a simple man that lived and died as an example. So for Athanasius, that was was wrong. And the church in Egypt and the, the churches in the empire should not follow along with this doctrine because it's heretical. They'll lose their lives to heresy. They'll live their lives on heresy and lose it. Athanasius, towards the end of his life, even after winning his case with the rest of the Orthodox priests and and, and pastors in Nicaea, lived for the remainder of his 50 years afterwards fighting this same battle. Even though it was approved by Emperor Constantine in 325, his son Constantius came into play and wanted to become an Arian and kicked Athanasius out. And so this famous Nicene Creed that we have is due in part because of what happened at Nicaea. But Athanasius lived, therefore, for 50, 40, 50 years afterwards, fighting consistently against the Romans, against the Greeks, against the emperor himself, against the churches themselves, the Arians themselves, fighting consistently a battle of theology all the way up until his death. He was exiled from Egypt consistently, one time, two times, three times exiled, fighting against the world, and therefore Athanasius became known as contramundum, me against the world. Athanasius against the world, because though it was a more popular way of seeing Christ, because even the emperor was behind this, though it was a more satisfying and a more popular way to do church in the fourth century, Athanasius stood up against these errors and claimed right orthodox doctrine, even at the cost of his own life. In 373, Athanasius dies, even in exile, fighting for this very movement. Only nine years later, in 381, by the grace of God, those people that Athanasius influenced, like Gregory of Nicaea and Gregory of Nazianzus and Basil, it was only them that pushed forward and actually won the controversy in 381. But this stands in contrast to what we're talking about in John chapter 15. People that love the world, that are passionate about the things of the world, can never preach to the world because they're not against it. Rather, The world is against the Christian evangelical proclamation. Christianity is always in the crosshairs of popular culture and will always be in the crosshairs of pop culture because, as we read, it hates God. So right from the the forefront of this text, friends, you have this concept of a life contramundum of a life that is against the world, or a disciple should therefore live a life against the world. You should be known to be against the world, not in the sense that you're always fighting or complaining about it like a lot of us do, especially on social media, but rather that you're against what the world loves. You don't do as the world does. You don't love what the world loves because it hates God. In stark contrast of what we read in the last verses from verses 9 and especially 9, 12, and 17 of chapter 15, we see God's love. We see God's love of the Father towards the Son. We see the love of the Son towards His disciples. And then we see that the disciples, therefore, are to love one another. In verse 13 of chapter 15, we see this concept called no greater love has one than this, that he lays down his life for his friends. 
In verse 14, his disciples have been trans, uh, trans, uh, transferred over to friends of God, friends of Christ, because they are loved, consistently loved by the maker of the universe. God's love for them is evident. It's marked before them and for them. They are loved by God. And therefore, they are to love each other. So disciples, therefore, should ask themselves if this genuine, perfect, unstained love is really enough. If it is, then why would a disciple be preoccupied by seeking the approval and love from the world? What is the preoccupation with a disciple even in the first century movement? What would be the reasoning for seeking approval from the world? There should be no preoccupation. There should, no be, there should not be any worry whether or not the world will accept them because as Christ has made evident, they've already hated him before they would hate them. When we were younger, if you've been in church for a long time, maybe you grew up in church, you were always embarrassed at times about your Christianity. I mean, I'll say this in my case at least. Maybe you were a lot better than me as a child or as a young man. But it, there were some moments in time where people would find out that you would be Christian and you'd kind of be like, I, yeah, I go and yeah, but it's cool though. We're, we're, we're not weird like other people. We're not like them. We're not. It's kind of cool. It's it's all right. But you would feel some level of embarrassment because the world would see Christianity. At least back even twenty years ago, when I was young, even back twenty years ago, there was still some level of just apathy and skepticism. But more like, man, you guys are just weird. But nowadays, in the twenty-first century, twenty years later, the world has grown more towards their hatred against the things of God, especially because everything we stand for is against popular culture. Everything, friends. I can't get into everything that we stand for because we'd be here for ages. But everything the, the, wor the, the Word of God specifically says is in contrast to popular culture's needs and desires. There's a stigma, therefore, in the church that we are not only hypocrites, but that we have an old doctrine that we abide by that has no relevancy in modern day culture. We're simply antiquated. We're simply confound to a pa patriarchal system that has enslaved us. The modern disciple, therefore, should not accept the fact that we need to seek approval or win favor in popular culture. Because the Word of God itself calls us foreigners, strangers, exiles. A lot of, a lot of people, in, in, even in the Hispanic world, have understood this and, and they feel that maybe... Maybe you've never felt it because you were born in the United States, but there's a lot of foreigners that feel that when they're not born in the United States, they, they're, they're constantly looking over their back. Their, their parents brought them here. They, they weren't even aware that they were coming to the United States. They were probably one or two years old. Their parents bring them over here. They have no concept. They have no authority of their own. And now they have to grow up in a world that, that in most cases, rejects them because they can't get a legitimate job, they can't get scholarships, they can't go to school, and they're downcast. They feel that, and they understand that concept of foreigners because they really don't get the privilege of citizenship until they become one. But the church in that case is seen almost in the same light. Foreigners, exiles, and strangers in this world. But I love what Paul says in the, in the Ephesian epistle, chapter 219. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, 
but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. The church then replaces the comfort of the world and establishes its citizenship at a different level. Approval at a celestial level because now we are members and saints of the household of God. Peter will say it like this, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Those passions of the flesh will come by, by means of desires in this world. Everything that we desire, desire carnally will have to do with the things of this world most of the time. Think about it, the, the advancement of careers. Now, none of this is wrong per se, but if this is the driving factor in the disciples' life, then we must question or halt. If we are only seeking to advance our careers, if we only want more money in this life to be happy, if we only want more privilege or if we only want more uh, uh, authority or power or influence, if that's the only thing that we're seeking for in this world, then chances are we are living more according to what the world demands than what it really means to be a disciple. So therefore, at the very front of this section in John's Gospel, we are confronted immediately with hatred. Confronted immediately with the hatred of the world because Christ wants to remind His disciples, you will not be loved. You will not be accepted. Like, get that through your heads. You want to follow me, there is a cross you must carry. And for many... It will be this rejection. Although in the first century, the cross that many of them would have to carry would actually be martyrdom. For many 21st century disciples, this cross they will have to carry is rejection, is embarrassment, is abandonment from their own families, is isolation because the world hates them. In this brief passage, I'm going to highlight three things that the world hates. Three things that the world hates. One, we see it immediately in verse 18, it hates God. That's the first thing. We'll see that in verse 18, we'll see that in verse 21, we'll see that in verse 23 through 24. The world hates God. The second thing the world hates it hates what God loves. So it doesn't only hate God, it hates what he loves. We'll see that in verses 19 and 20. And three, the world hates God's word. You see that in verse 22 and 25. It hates God's word. So let's start from the very beginning. What does the world hate? The world hates God. That's number one. Verse 18, chapter 15, verse 18. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. So now we have this grand opposition of between God's love in verses 9 through 17 and the world's hatred. But it also stands in uniformity with how John presents his gospel. Light and darkness, love and hate, truth and falseness. This is in the same light as a big contrast on how the world operates because God loves the world. We see that in John 3.16, right? We see that God's love is overpowering and over uh, the, the, the church and even those who were sinners like us and even in the first century. God loved the sinner. It's a great reminder in opposition to God's love how the world hates but how God actually loves. If you remember just a little verse, a couple of verses before in chapter 15, 
Verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Here is the love of God in contrast to the world's hatred. What do we see? We see that God chose us while we were sinners. When he had no reason to love, but every reason to hate and demonstrate wrath and justice. He chose us in that state. 1 John, or the epistles of John, will go on to say it like this in 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us. You see that? We were always in the state of hatred, just like the world. But even in that state, God's love overpowers and brings his sons to repentance. 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. So although the world hates God, we are reminded that God loved the world that hated God. Him. The greatness of God is depicted in this first act of love. Disciples hated God. They were enemies with God, just like what we read in James. If you love the world, you're an enemy of God. And now I know that may sound harsh and kind of like, oh, that's a little bit uneasy, but it's true. If the disciples are to live according to the pleasures of this world, then their lives will be governed by the love for this world and not the love of God. So while we hated God, He loved us and gave us salvation. But then the world also hates God because verse 21 clarifies the reason for this hatred. Go to verse 21. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name because they do not know him who sent me. What is the leading factor in this hatred towards God? Ignorance. They don't know God. And knowledge is, we've seen this word, gnosko, Time and time again in John's gospel, knowing. Knowing is equated not with simple wisdom or simple information. Knowledge is the understanding of salvation, the realization that we need to be saved from our sinful life. This is the knowledge that the Christian or that the disciple displays. We don't know God or we hate God because we simply don't know him. Why do you think a lot of people, even in our modern context, are very indifferent towards God? They, they really don't care about the things of God, primarily because they don't know the sad state they're in. Have you tried to invite your friends to church? It's, it's a rather difficult task. Have you tried preaching the gospel to your coworkers? It's fairly difficult because No one wants to hear that, especially on a Monday morning when you're sitting in your cubicle having to listen to somebody talk about Christ. No one wants to hear it. It's not the talk of the day. It's not what movie you saw. It's not a Netflix show. It's not something that you experienced over the weekend. It's talking about, God, give me a break. No one wants to hear about that because they don't understand or know their sad state. They hate God because they don't know him. So a disciple then is someone who is a receptor of God's love. A disciple has received God's love even in the state of their hatred towards God. Their eyes have been opened. Think about it like this. The apostle Paul was on his way to kill Christians, to persecute Christians, and then, boom, the Holy Spirit woke him up. In that state, it wasn't like Paul was kind of contemplating, maybe I shouldn't persecute the church. Maybe 
Maybe these Christians have it right. Let me talk to them a little bit. Let me get more information. You know, I heard that, that Peter guy, he's, he's pretty cool. Let me, let me go talk to him a little bit. Let me kind of understand his position, and then maybe I can make a better uh, decision about this. No! Paul was on mission, and it was God who woke him up and brought him to himself, even in that hatred. See, friends, there is a magnitude, there is an importance to our worship. And there is that profound understanding of worship when you realize who you were before God. What God did in your life before he rescued you. There's always a level of humbleness because you and I were nobody. And God loved us. Disciples are receptors of God's love. And not only receptors, they are givers of God's love. We have the privilege of receiving reconciliation. And now we have are made ministers of reconciliation with the world. John says in his epistle, again, 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, anyone who does, does not love does not know God because God is love. It's like simple. It's ABCs, one, two, threes, do, re, mis. These are simple, simple realities of the Christian life, yet it is one of the most difficult to do. We receive God's love, which is often rather easy because, yeah, who doesn't want to be loved? And if there is a God who doesn't want to be loved by the maker and creator of all the universe, thank you, love me, yes, of course, I deserve it. But to give love to others that don't deserve my love? To give love to others that, that talk bad about me behind my back, that, that, that really don't care about my people, that don't care about my personality, that don't care about my family? Why would I love someone else? And it's the simple things that are a reminder of lack of discipleship in the church. It reminds us that the church will always be filled with people, but not disciples. It reminds us that the church can, can exist with thousands and yet, seldom or few that actually love. Disciples, we are receptors and givers of God's love. The world, they're haters in both modern and Old New Testament terminology. They hate. The descriptor of the world is hatred. Verse 23 and 24, they hate God and the Son. You, you see the emphasis here? It, it's, it's double emphatic. It's not just God. It's the Son of God. This is an emphasis that John is putting into the text so that the Holy Spirit can awaken this reality in the life of the person that know that this world has hated God. And hates the Son because they bear testimony to all his works. Let's look at that verse again. Whoever hates me hates my Father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin, but now they have seen and hated both me and my Father. Why? Because of their works, the revelation of sin. There is no excuse, and we're going to see this two, two more times, I mean one more time. We see this revelation of a person's sin that causes hatred. It's too much light, I can't hide, I can't, I can't go covert, I can't hide in my sin and love my sin because there's too much light. And this Jesus figure is a giver of too much light and so therefore, it makes me uncomfortable to even listen or to even be around this concept of Jesus. I love my sin. Why would I give up my way of living? What's so wrong with how I'm living? 
And again, we say this consistently because this is how the world sees the church. All you do is judge us, but we're good people. We work hard. We, are, we go to school. We try to raise our children right. We try to raise our children to respect other kids. We, we don't kill anybody. We don't steal. We don't rob. We, we live an a honorable life. We, we don't cheat on our taxes. We, we do all of this, and we're good people. We're hardworking people. What's the big deal with the church and always pointing the finger at us? Therefore, part of the hatred comes in this aspect of being receptors of judgment, but the reality is that no one is perfect before the eyes of God. Are you good enough? You may be good enough as opposed to several other people that you grew up with. You may be better off than the high school friends you had that partied all through college and and, and, and just gave up. You may be better off economically, career-wise, But what about your soul? What about your heart? And the heart is the throne room of all evil. Jeremiah calls that the throne room almost in a literal sense. Psalter reminds us to guard our hearts. Jesus, therefore, reveals the sin by what he does. There was no more excuse, friends. Who else is going to raise the dead? I mean, people saw Jesus raising Lazarus. People saw Jesus feeding the thousands. These works that were an, an emphatic sign that he came from God could not be explained any other way. Like, we could kind of explain even, I'm going to date myself here a little bit, but, but remember the Chris Angel and, and the floatingness and, and, and doing all these weird, and David Blaine on the street doing the street magic? Like, you could kind of explain that and kind of figure out that there's some type of mirrors and all this hoax going on. They actually had a show on, on, the, on false magicians. I can't remember the name of it, but, but you could kind of explain that. How do you explain raising somebody that was dead for four days? It's unexplainable and therefore unexcusable. Ignorance will never be a proper excuse. I didn't know, God. I didn't. I'm sorry. I I just didn't know. Never an excuse. Jesus says, I revealed, I work, I do your wonderful works, and they hate me and they hate the Father. They rather forget that God is really holy and that they need a savior or they rather point God and make God a God of all love with no justice because therefore they need no salvation God will love them just the way they are they turn God into something that's completely contrary to his nature and sort of castrate God so to simply deny him would be an easier way to go about it. We hate God because, as a matter of fact, God may not even exist. All you people have been fooled for thousands of years. There is no God. One of uh, the famous New Testament scholars, commentators on the New Testament, Leon Morris, says this to sum up this concept. It is not without its significance that the disciples are to be known by their love and the world by its hatred. That's it. Disciples love, the world hates. Number two, what else does the world hate? The world hates what God loves. Number one, the world hates God. So obviously, whatever God does, as we saw already with the works of Christ, they will hate as well. Whatever God loves, the world will hate. At the crosshairs of this stand the disciples. All the disciples will have genuine hatred towards them because the world hates God and because God loves his people and his disciples. But it's simply more than collateral damage, friends. 
It isn't like, oh, we just hate God and, oh, yeah, you guys too, because you guys follow God, we're going to hate you guys too. No, there is a conscious effort, conscious effort to eradicate and to kill off the disciples of Christ. As a matter of fact, the first century church suffered martyrdom. The first disciples, apostles of Christ, suffered martyrdom. Even James the Older was put before the Jerusalem council a couple, 20, probably 20 years after Christ. Did no wrong but preached the gospel and he was murdered. The tradition says that even Thomas, remember doubting Thomas? We talked about him in the resurrection. Tradition says that doubting Thomas ended up in Syria and he was killed there for the preaching of the gospel. You know Paul, you know Peter, imprisoned until they finally were murdered by the emperor. The disciples will have genuine hatred from the world towards them because the disciples are loved by God. They've been united with Christ. They've been set apart from Christ. They've been chosen out of the world. Look at what verse 19 says. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. The world hates your election. The world hates the fact that God loves you. You've been chosen. This is Something that keeps coming up in John's gospel. Eklego my election, being chosen, being predestined. God's love was never a matter of eeny, meeny, miny, mo. He chose you with specific purpose. And in that choosing and in that election, he demonstrated his love. And in that love, the world would go on to hate they will be persecuted because of Christ and because of his name. The world hates God. The world hates what God loves. And ultimately, the world, number three, hates God's word. Look at what verse 22 says. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of Sin, but now they have no excuse. There it is again. No excuse for their sin. Again, they cannot plead ignorance because Jesus was teaching. Jesus was preaching. Jesus was giving light and shedding light until it was fulfilled what had already been spoken about in which he says in verse 29. Scripture was fulfilled. God's word as a revealer of sin. And there it is. I didn't say it. God's word is a revealer of sin. The reason why preaching is so important in modern day, the reason why we need to spread God's word in modern day, the reason why we're praying for Ismael to go to Ukraine to not simply give items of hygiene, but to preach God's word is because it is a revealer of sin. And it isn't until people know the depravity of their soul that they could come to Christ who loves. But when people realize that their sin is exposed before them, they hate those who expose. They hate the word that is truth because they're used to being governed by falsity. So therefore, friends, the world will hate you as a disciple because they hate God first. They will hate you because you are loved by God. And they will hate you because you've submitted yourselves to God's word. I pray that every single one of you here have submitted themselves to God's word 
understands the importance of God's word to live according to God's word. Don't make up your own way of living. Live according to God's word, even if the world hates you. So again, I always like to end in the question, what's, what friendship, what allegiance do you want? Do you want friendship with the world? Do you want do you want a certain level of popularity? Do you want a certain level of comfort in your life? Do you want a certain level of prestige, honor, position? Do you want this world to hug you and say, this is the type of Christian that we like? You know, he's not always telling us about sin and stuff like that. He talks to us about God's love. She talks to us about God's love. I like this type of Christian. They look cool. They even wear ripped jeans like us. They look hip. I love it. They wear the cool hats. They look cool. They're less threatening. Or or you want to be loved by God. Jesus calls us friends, calls his disciples friends. But sometimes we call the world our friend. So the decision, friends, is yours at the end of the day. If you've come to Christ, you've come to Christ because he's calling you out of the world. And you can respond to that through the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. But if not, you will continue living a life that is in friendship with the world and therefore enemies of God. Why don't you stand this morning? And Pastor Oscar will come up in a bit to pray for the special offering. But let me pray for you before we move forward in this service. Father, we, we pray that more than anything, your love become evident in our lives. That we know you and we know your love to be true. And so that even though the world hates us, even though the world abhors you, that we could still hold our heads up high and walk in integrity, knowing that God the Father loves us. Fathers, if, if there's anyone here that, that doesn't, doesn't know the meaning of your love, but has been exposed to it by your word this morning, Father, that they come to you, that they come seek you, have any questions we could answer, Father, we would be delighted to bring them closer to you. Show them who you are. Open their hearts and open their minds. In Jesus' name, amen.